What's up guys? I'm gonna be honest with you. I think I may have a confession to make. I am obsessed with Resident Evil. Now, I'm not quite sure that needs to be said, as most of you watching this likely found me through my coverage of that series or games inspired by it. But what some of you may not know is I have an equally unhealthy obsession with the differences that can crop up when porting a game to multiple systems. I really couldn't tell you why, but I've just always really enjoyed finding those small details that might have been altered during the porting process or differences you'll see in video when jumping from one system to the next. And in that same vein, I have always thought Resident Evil Code Veronica is a criminally unappreciated entry in the dynasty that is the RE franchise, so I figured why not head pop two zombies with one shotgun blast. Today I'm looking to dig deep into the many versions of this lesser loved entry and find out exactly how they differ and if possible, figure out which one is most deserving of your time. So after an uncomfortably long absence, it feels great to say once again, what's up guys, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews, welcome to the Resident Evil Retrospective. Time, you genetically inferior siblings. <laughs> Resident Evil Code Veronica is a bit of a black sheep in the classic survival horror entries of the series, but at least a portion of the audience fell in love with Claire Redfield's return to the series. It should probably go without saying, but I've already covered this title pretty extensively in a past video in my Resident Evil retrospective, but just to catch some of the newbies up, Code Veronica sees Claire from RE2 setting out to find her brother. After being a particularly annoying thorn in Umbrella's side, she is eventually captured and taken to an island training facility that I guess they were also using as a holding cell for people that needed to be gotten rid of. During her stay, there was some kind of an attack on the island and the T-Virus seems to have been purposefully spread, causing even further chaos. After realizing the place was doomed, one of her jailers let Claire out of her cell and the first leg of the game is spent attempting to escape this hellhole with a friend she met along the way, Steve. A person who's so Canadian, and this is true, the whole of Canada agrees he's taking it a bit too far. Uh, sorry about that little misunderstanding, but I thought you were another one of those monsters. Shut up! The two eventually unravel the history of Umbrella's creation and the family behind it. Sitting at the head of that family is a guy who, in the absence of his twin sister, sort of lost his mind and has been essentially cosplaying her until he can see her again. The rest of the game turns in a few unexpected directions, including the reveal that Chris is no longer missing and is actively retracing Claire's steps, culminating in what I would call a pretty damn enjoyable time. But sadly, there's a lot of you watching right now who wouldn't agree. For some reason, this game catches a lot of hell, which was a huge revelation for me to find out. When I released my video on this during the heyday of the Resident Evil retrospective, I was shocked to see so many people in the comments having such negative things to say about it. To be totally honest, I had always just figured everyone loved the game the same way I did. Now, it seems like there are a few complaints that crop up when this title is discussed, but the most odd was a common theme of the game being too difficult something that seems strange to me because CV has never really given me too many issues at all. In a typical playthrough, I'm able to keep my handgun ammo above 150 at all times, and here's the amount of green herbs I collected just before the first tyrant fight. And it's not like I'm some kind of expert at dodging zombies. I put down easily 85 to 90% of the zombies I come across, and as far as herbs go, I've actually made it a personal rule that first aid sprays are never to be used during any RE playthrough. By the way, don't ask me why, because I have literally no idea. For Christ's sakes, I still save like a crazy person, so it's not like I'm going for that coveted S rank on completion. Apparently, I'm just a little unhinged. And by the way, by no means is this me trying to brag to you guys, because I'm not even that good at the game compared to most people who play it. My point is, I just don't know where all these comments about the game's difficulty are coming from. On that note though, if I did have a list of advice to those of you that have stayed away, I'd say numbers 1 through 10 would be use the knife more. In this game, a downward strike can hit multiple times, and once you're good with judging the right distance, you can clear most rooms without ever firing a single bullet. Yes, you are probably going to take a little bit of damage during that process, but I find this game to be pretty forgiving as far as zombie grabs go. On top of that, make sure to start unloading your grenade launcher from the starting position with BOW rounds during the tyrant fight and you'll never even have to see him on screen before you kill him. No joke, I've been doing this so long I've got it memorized. Three BOW rounds, two acid rounds, hit the button, boom, Bob's your uncle. And 
for the last two, save often, and if you come across what seems to be the end of a section, make sure to put all of your hard-hitting weapons in the item box so Chris has access to them and vice versa. If you get those tips down, I think you'll find a much easier experience here, but we're not exactly running a tips and tricks channel, so why not jump into the stuff you all came here to see in the first place? I've got you now. <laughs> As some of you may have noticed, we started with the original Dreamcast release of Code Veronica, and as all of you may have noticed, it looks absolutely amazing. There's no doubt the Dreamcast was a pretty impressive little piece of hardware, but if you ask me, this was the best looking game in its library, at least as far as convincingly realistic graphics go. As is common knowledge at this point, before this release, Resident Evil was well known for its pre-rendered backgrounds and static camera angles. But Code Veronica introduced a slight evolution to those approaches with fully rendered 3D environments, which in turn allowed for a camera that was still static in placement, but could track Claire in certain areas. These two elements put together, at the time, always struck me as the natural direction the series would grow in as it kept getting bigger, and yes, I'm still a little pissed off that didn't come true. With 3D environments comes lighting that can be both cast on your character and the background, and this stuff really blew me away at the time. Of course, looking at Claire holding a lighter and seeing it not only light her realistically, but the room around her isn't going to impress anyone today, but we hadn't seen anything even nearing this in the series up to this point. Next up on my long list of stuff I love about this game's presentation is the incredibly detailed zombie models. Not only are all the gory little details I want on full display here, but there's also a huge variety of individual zombies to boot. Sadly, a headshot from a shotgun no longer decapitates them, and to be honest, I've always wondered if this was a move meant to save on processing power or a lazy way to make sure they didn't need to make any changes in the game in order to fit a decent Sero rating in Japan. Character models and cutscenes are an absolute treat, with lots of details being present and some very impressive facial animations for the time. Now, sure, it's not the best I've seen, but it's most definitely the best I've seen on the Dreamcast. The inventory still uses 2D sprites for its icons, and I still absolutely love that. You also get to see a nice variety of locations, with each one containing a lot of environmental details and a very lived in kind of feel. All around, this is just an incredible looking game, but more than that, it truly feels like the RE series really jumping into the next generation of gaming hardware. Which was certainly a treat at the time, but is even more impressive looking back retroactively today. Seeing as the next time we would see a generational jump like this in the main series, it would be for a game that plays like RE about as much as a session of Bubble Bobble does. What you're looking at right now is being provided by a relatively cheap Retrobit VGA cable, which is outputting a surprisingly clean 480p image to my OSSC that simply line doubles that to an integer scale of 960p. For the longest time, I've been using a JP21 cable for my Dreamcast because I thought I needed to spend an arm and a leg to get a clean signal out of the console, but it is clear I was dead wrong. If you look at them side by side, the difference between the JP21 cable's 480i and the VGA cable's 480p is about as clear as clear can possibly get. Sadly, all of that amazing quality does come with the downside though. At this point in console hardware, dithering was just a fact of life, and almost every major console used this little trick to save on performance, at least some of the time. And if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, dithering is this checkerboard type pattern you can see in the background here. This was essentially a workaround that allowed a console to have a lot of colors on screen without having to render a smooth gradient between each shade. And you know it worked really well if this is the first time you're seeing it. Typically, the combination of a CRT display and a composite video connection blurred the image enough to mask a lot of dithering on most consoles, so I apologize if I just lifted the veil for you. Personally, I love the way a dithered picture looks on an old console, but I know that's not a universal opinion, so keep that in mind if you're looking to play Code Veronica at higher resolutions on real Dreamcast hardware. Other than that, though, I really can't see any problems with this game graphically speaking. Not only does it look incredible to my eye, but it also looks better than just about anything the Dreamcast had to offer at the time. It took the bright, popping colors the console was known for and combined them into a Resident Evil game, which should be a combination that spells disaster. But somehow, it worked out just perfectly. If you ask me, the console this game was made for is a huge contributing factor to its unique look, and even as the series would continue on bigger and better hardware, I'd say Code Veronica is one of the most visually unique entries in the franchise. 
So I guess the only question left is what happens when you take that unique display and try to cram it into a Sony console? Wait a second, what just happened? I despise Chris. Uh, what are you gonna do to him? With the re-release of Code Veronica on different platforms, Capcom elected to do something you really don't see too much anymore. They added some stuff. The games released with the Code Veronica X title have had additions that alter the gameplay to a degree that, honestly, it's sort of hard to argue whether or not they're improvements. First off, the short title screen intro has been altered so that Wesker's reveal doesn't get ruined, which I guess is okay. I mean, the fact that old Blondie was in the game was plastered all over game magazines of the day, so I'm not too sure who they're trying to protect from spoilers here. In addition, there have been extra Wesker scenes added to the game, which sort of undoes the point of messing with the original intro in my opinion. In the new scene just before Alfred starts the island self-destruct sequence, Wesker shows up. And my only real issue with that is, the original scene where he first shows up in the original release of the game did a good job of obscuring his face and sort of keeping you guessing. Where in CVX, he just sort of shows up to accomplish nothing much at all, and the best part is, that original scene with his face obscured is still in the game during Chris's campaign. So now you'll meet Wesker and then an hour later watch a cutscene that tries its hardest to make sure you don't know Wesker's in the game. Which is, I don't know, kind of funny, really, when you think about it. Getting into the comparisons, I would say the PS2 has a pretty bad showing, actually. Man, what is it with Capcom and screwing up PS2 ports? So starting out, I was immediately hit with this very nasty ghosting when the game is in motion. Here, let me slow things down so YouTube's compression can't mess it up. Hopefully you can see the issue I'm talking about here. It's that shadow of Claire that's visible in every other frame. It looks to me like interpolation, something that shouldn't be necessary. I mean, I've got to assume the PS2 is powerful enough to run this game at full speed, so why would they implement something like this? I can't really imagine someone would think this was a good stylistic choice, so I tried looking it up on Google, but it seems like no one's noticed this, except for this guy here, but after reading his thread, most people seem to be blaming his TV. Now I know what some of you may be thinking, and no, this was not caused by my scaler. Both the FrameMeister and OSSC display the same issue, and I can confirm it does still exist at native 480i over component. Honestly, I would have loved to have solved this mystery, but I think it's going to have to stay just that for now. In the meantime, let's all collectively try and figure out why some text has artifacts at the edges of its boundaries. If I had to take a shot in the dark, I might guess that this has something to do with the fact that the Dreamcast outputs a sort of non-standard width for its video output, maybe taking sprite sheets from one console to another ended up doing this somehow. In the Dreamcast original, I noticed that getting the perfect downward knife angle was sort of hard since the D-pad on the old DC controller could be so loose that it would register diagonals. And here on the PS2, I did not have that issue. So there is one win under its belt, but immediately negating this is the drastically darker picture. I mean, we're talking pretty damn dark, and adjusting brightness both in-game and on my Frame Meister yields even worse results, with the whole picture going gray. That shows me that it's probably something inherent to this specific version of the game and not settings on my end in any way. Continuing with those problems, the CG cutscenes on the PS2 are very dirty looking. There might be a chance that the dithering on the Dreamcast helped smooth over some of the compression artifacts, but I can say without a doubt that the DC original takes the win as far as CGs go. Now this next little tidbit used to bother the hell out of me back in the day. In these CVX ports, Capcom decided to give Steve a solid amount of emo bangs, and when I first played this version of the game, I just couldn't understand why they'd do that. In my own personal opinion, he looked much better with the hard Leon Kennedy style side part, but what would drive a development team to waste man hours on something like this? Well, while browsing some random forum years and years ago, I stumbled across this idea that they were worried the actor Leonardo DiCaprio would sue them for taking his likeness, and it seems like a majority of the internet agrees on this one. That being said, I really can't see why Capcom would have thought that. I mean, he isn't exactly the spitting image of Leo, and I think his annoying Canadian mannerisms probably make him at least legally different from the actor. Now this being a PS2 release, Code Veronica X is locked to 480i video output, or at least it used to be, more on that in a sec. As you may or may not know, interlaced video can be a pain in the ass to work with on digital displays, so instead of relying on the OSSC shaky Bob the interlacing method, I went with the Frame Meister to get this footage, because adaptive deinterlacing just looks so much better to me in motion. Of course, one of the downsides with going this route is you'll probably notice combing artifacts in the footage at random spots where the scaler couldn't keep up with the fast movements in the game, which are these horizontal lines breaking up the image on stuff moving on screen. 
Adding on to that, a static interlaced image can look very sharp with a frame meister, but once it starts moving around, you'll notice it blurs a little bit. And the other downside being, the frame meister can introduce a lot of visual noise on certain colors and patterns. Sadly, most of those colors being on the darker end of the spectrum, and this being a very dark game. So if you're going to play CVX on PS2 and you're debating on how to do it, I wouldn't go with the Frame Meister as a first choice. That is unless you're dumb enough to run a YouTube channel with the goal of comparing ports and you don't want this bouncy jumbled mess that Bob the Interlacing can cause. Now I know I just painted a pretty poor picture of this port, and to be honest it scored really low on my side of things, but keep in mind these kind of issues can be very prevalent to my eye, but if the comments section has taught me anything, it's that most people don't even see this stuff. If you're planning on playing this on a CRT, you likely aren't going to have a clear enough picture for most of these flaws to even present themselves in the first place. But there is something you can do to really improve your visual experience with this version of the game. A while back, you guys may remember me covering a utility called GSM, which was a piece of homebrew that runs on PS2s using custom firmware and can force progressive scan video output. Back when I covered it, GSM was a little hit or miss. Depending on the game, you could get really good looking results or this nasty mess of alias stair stepping. Well, it seems like that may not be the case anymore, and a massive thanks to El Mariachi for cluing me in on this. The newish 1.0 release of Open PS2 Loader has a version with GSM baked in, and it works amazingly from what I can tell. I tried somewhere near 18 or 19 different titles, and only one of them seemed to result in absolute garbage on screen, so we could definitely call that a win. Selecting the HDTV60 option from the insane list of image modes has the PS2 either performing the deinterlacing internally or some kind of other magic is going on because the result is a great looking progressive scan image. The difference may be a little hard to notice on the surface, but the resulting image is much cleaner and far nicer to look at in motion. With the game outputting clean 480p just like the good lord intended, we can switch over to the OSSC and further clean things up. You guys genuinely have no idea how hard I struggled with the idea of recording all of my footage in forced 480p, but luckily my Patreon supporters talked some sense into me. And I think they were right. The goal here is typically to give you guys an idea of how each of these ports look natively so you can decide which one takes home a W in your eyes, but I'm not so dedicated to that idea that I won't throw up a quick comparison for the hell of it. As you can see, sharpness doesn't seem to be noticeably improved from one to the other, but the small details in the face are much cleaner and blend more naturally. Plus, there's the bonus of not having the image blur a bit when it's in motion thanks to external deinterlacing. So if you ask me, this is a clear win in 480p's favor. Now, this may not be the most accessible solution in the world, but if you have a Freemic Boot memory card laying around and a spare USB drive, get your hands on GSM and experience the game the way the developers likely would have wanted you to. And I think this is as good a time as any to switch over to our next contestant. Steve, watch out! Do not worry, brother. I will handle them both myself. Who is there? The GameCube has quickly started creeping up on my list of favorite consoles lately, mostly due to a combination of the GCHD Mark II and a nice little utility called Swiss that lets me force 480p in games that don't support it natively. But once again, we're going to err on the side of authenticity and use the default and only video mode code Veronica X shipped with. The first bit of good news is the ugly frame interpolated ghosting isn't present here, which leads to a much smoother looking image in motion. The dark picture on the PS2 was a real issue for me, and while the GameCube version isn't a massive improvement, you can now see small details through the darkness, so I'll go ahead and chalk that one up as a win. That being said, there is a massively noticeable difference in sharpness between the PS2's 480i and the GameCube's 480i. At first I had to go back and recapture my comparisons thinking I had the sharpness cranked on the Frame Meister for the PS2 playthrough, but nope, there's just a massive divide between the two. Whether because of this little quirk or in spite of it, I'm happy to report that the CG cutscenes look much better on the cube with those ugly compression artifacts getting smoothed over for this release. And other than that, I really didn't notice much that would set this release apart from the PS2 version, at least as far as native video output goes. Just like the PS2, the GameCube has its own way of forcing progressive scan. Using the homebrew software called Swiss and some kind of SD card launcher, you can force 480p on GameCube games that never supported it in the past, and once again, I really couldn't tell you if this is forcing the GameCube to actually double the lines of resolution, or if it's just deinterlacing it internally. But holy hell, the difference is so noticeable. With a PS2, you sort of had to look close to really see the benefits of 480i versus 480p, but on the GameCube, it is night and day, not only in sharpness, but also in sheer clarity. 
This game becomes so much more satisfying to look at in progressive scan, and if at all possible, I'd fully recommend you go this route for your next playthrough. Since we switched to 480p, we're now line doubling with the OSSC, which means a much cleaner picture with less video noise, and call me a traitor, but I'm starting to use the Meister less and less since I got my hands on an OSSC. And yes, I did say that quietly so that it didn't hear me. I will say one thing though, the GameCube without a doubt has the most comfortable default button mapping of all of the versions. The original DC release has the menu on the B button, which just feels wrong to me, and the PS2 port has me reaching all the way to the start button anytime I want to use an herb. On the GameCube's controller, the inventory is mapped to Y, which is about as close to the action and cancel buttons as you can get, which leads to a much more satisfying press during gameplay. Sadly, that is not the whole story though. The other half of the controller kind of negates this little gain. And I think little is definitely the word to emphasize here. With every release of CV so far, the D-pad has been the go-to, but as some of you may know, Nintendo saw fit to make their D-pad on the GameCube just a little smaller than the smallest conceivable thing on Earth. So you're either left with that or the analog stick, and sure, the analog stick on a GameCube controller can be great for a lot of scenarios, but tank controls most certainly is not one of them. So I switched back and forth. I'd use the D-pad for situations where I had to do some quick and accurate zombie dodging and switch to the analog stick when my thumb started to cramp up from the D-pad. Moving from the Dreamcast to the PS2 saw the game fitting on a single DVD instead of two GD-ROMs on the DC, but the GameCube's adorable little mini DVDs need to be split up again. Now that's not exactly an issue or anything, it's just something I thought was worth mentioning. If you absolutely have to make a decision between the GameCube and PS2 releases, well, let's just say I don't envy you. These two ports of the game seem to cancel each other out with their unique flaws and interesting upsides. If it weren't for the D-pad and analog situation, I would say the Cube offers the best controller layout, and if the PS2 didn't have such a smeary, blurry ghosting issue, I'd say it clearly takes the win as far as stock video output is concerned. To be totally honest, between the three available versions of the game, I'm gonna have to go with... I bet you thought I was gonna end it there, didn't you? Listen, you guys don't come here for half-assed poor comparisons. The patented Avalanche Reviews method is to dig deeper than anyone wants and give you guys information you most certainly will never use. And in that vein, did you know there's a PS4 release of Code Veronica X? My apologies, but I cannot let you escape now. <laughs> You see? This thing is a lot more reliable than any person. To be totally honest, I had all but forgot about this PSN release until it came time to work on this video, which is a real shame because I'd say this could be a top performer on this list. Emphasis on the could be. It seems pretty clear to me that they used the PS2 port as a base for this upconversion because we're seeing the same odd artifacts and certain sprites again, which really does bother me. I mean, was there really nothing that could be done about this? Capcom did go in and replace some text, like in the save screen, so why not replace the stuff that was messed up in the first place? But getting back on track, this version of Code Veronica does look stunning to my eye, and it really should. These PS2 era games always look amazing when upscaled for HD releases because they have just enough on-screen polygons to ensure more can be added while still maintaining the integrity of the original picture, whereas something like a PS1 game might require approximation and a whole lot of other work. Since we're working with a pure digital video output method this time around, there's absolutely no noise in the image, which can be jarring for someone like myself who mostly works with analog video being upscaled after the fact, but all of that should be obvious and expected for a PS4 release. What really surprised me though are the improvements they made over the original PS2 release during this process. First off, the brightness and gamma have been nearly perfected this time around. For those of you with short-term memory issues, the PS2 version of Code Veronica had me squinting into the foggy black of what should be a clearly visible background a lot of the time. But here on the PS4, I'd say things look perfect to my eye. Of course, some of the more foggy areas present in the Dreamcast original will still be represented here, but unlike on the PS2, we can actually see through it now, which is pretty nice. The very odd issue with ghosting that I noticed before is still present in this release, but it's to a much lesser degree. At first, I thought it had been totally fixed, but you'll still notice it in certain conditions. And while I would definitely love to complain about that, it is nice that they showed at least some effort to fix it. Of course, I would have preferred seeing it gone completely, but when the on-screen picture looks this good, a very small problem like that can be a little easier to forgive. On that same note, it seems like the CG cutscenes have been noticeably cleaned up. 
They do appear pixelated to an expectable degree, but with a lot less of the noise and color banding that showed up in the original PS2 version. In my opinion, this is the preferred plan of attack for upscales like this, as adding a bunch of filters to a CG cutscene to make it look quote unquote HD can sometimes make it look worse and subtracts from the original sharpness of the picture. But I think we can save a lot of time here by just describing Code Veronica X on the PS4 as a very visually clean package. Not only do we no longer have to worry about the PS2's famously noisy video output, but on top of that, improvements have been made to make sure the original look of the game meshes well with the cleaner nature of HD video. The only real massive downside I can list here is the fact that the picture is being stretched to such a noticeable degree, and I'm not really sure why that's happening because they're still using a non-widescreen picture. Now, to be totally honest, I doubt 99.9% .9 of people would notice this unless they have an eye for these things or recently played the original, but it seems like such a dumb issue to have and such a simple up conversion. I guess it could be worse though. For example, this could be the PAL region release, which only supports 50 Hz. Honestly, why do you guys in Europe take this from Sony? 50 Hz in the modern era is tantamount to a crime against humanity, in my opinion. If I were to give this release a grade, I'd say it's a pretty middle-of-the-road HD up conversion, adding literally nothing of note other than rock-solid improvements to video output and fixing three issues that were present in the source material. But as a port of the original, I'd say it's probably the one to reach for if you're looking to play Code Veronica nowadays. But some of you may have noticed I made sure to make the distinction of this being a port, because while they did certainly improve a few aspects, this is most certainly just a re-release of the PS2 original being internally upscaled by the PS4. So I guess the real question is, where does a guy go when he's looking to play CV but with a brand new coat of HD paint applied to the experience? Here, let me help you with that. Thanks, but I can take care of myself. The Resident Evil Code Veronica HD Remaster can be a very, very annoying game to look up since across the PS2, 3, and 4, each of these releases are simply called Code Veronica X. It seems like fans have taken to adding an HD at the end of the PS3 Remaster when talking about it online, but when searching the PlayStation Network, it can be hard to know which one is the HD Remaster and which one is the regular old normal upscale unless you go in already knowing the answer to that question. It really wouldn't have taken any effort at all for Capcom to have gotten together and decided on a naming scheme that would clear this up, but oh well. Before we talk about the game itself though, we should probably discuss why this counts as an HD remaster and why the PS4 re-release doesn't despite the fact that both technically run at an HD resolution. Code Veronica X on the PS4 while running at a much more HD resolution than the PS3 version and sort of being remastered in a few ways isn't an HD remaster because a majority of the game is made up of the original assets just upscaled internally. While on the other hand, Code Veronica HD on the PS3 has had a lot of work done to replace some of those original assets with ones that have been externally upscaled or even totally new ones. And to be honest, it could have been so much better. This one's going to be a roller coaster of ups and downs, so get ready. First up, thanks to the 3D nature of CB's environments, it was relatively easy for them to give us a 16x9 widescreen aspect ratio this time around, which is actually cool as hell to see. Every screen of the game houses just a little more detail on each side that can be really fun to look at, kind of like you're seeing it from a whole new angle. Also, all over the place you'll see fonts replaced with newer, more HD looking stuff and normally I'd rather look at the original 2D text upscaled, but this doesn't look bad at all to my eye. Because a lot of the 2D art has been smoothed over instead of having a more alias look, the new text kind of blends in and doesn't stand out as much as it can in other similar HD remasters. I was actually really stoked to see the pre-rendered cutscenes have been cleaned up considerably since they were awful to look at in the PS2 release, but for some reason I can't really place there's intermittent frame drops during these scenes. Sometimes they can be hard to spot and sometimes they're blatant as hell. For example, watch this scene from the Dreamcast original. KD4496, <sighs> welcome to your new home. And now the same scene from the PS3 remaster. WKD4496, <sighs> welcome to your new home. <sighs> I genuinely can't figure out why this is taking place. I mean, it would be one thing if they messed up changing the frame rate or something, but the cutscenes here play out at the same number of frames per second they always have. And keeping up with the trend of showing an improvement followed by how that improvement was messed up in the process, the game's original dynamic light sources seem to have been replaced with some more modern, impressive looking stuff, giving us much more realistic shadow casting. 
These new light sources often come with varying levels of bloom, and I guess that's okay if you get into that kind of stuff. I do like the addition of new, more flashy light sources, I just don't think the bloom effect was totally necessary. That being said, some of the areas aren't as bright with the new light sources, which can leave certain screens much darker than before, and sometimes way too dark. It seems like whoever did this remaster didn't think aliasing should exist in HD games, so they applied a smoothing filter over the entire screen, which does get rid of some of the jaggies, but also lessens the overall sharpness of the picture. I swear to god, while playing this game, I had to fight the urge to rub my eyes as if my vision was getting blurred and not the screen that was in front of me. On the purely negative side of things, in the spirit of giving it a fake HDR sort of look, CV on the PS3 has its contrast knob cranked to 11, and as a result it can be very harsh or garish to look at. If I'm being honest, there are some areas where this effect can actually add to the scene, but mostly I found the game too dark to call this a win overall. And since game devs of the era seem to have been under the impression that looking at their games with clean, unaltered visuals was some kind of sin, we see the early 2000s worst trend rear its ugly little head here bad screen obscuring static filters. Because if there's one thing that isn't ironic as all hell, it's upgrading from analog video to digital and then adding a bunch of visual noise that makes it look like analog video anyways. Well done guys. To be honest though, this filter might not have been such an issue for me if it didn't pair terribly with the new high contrast look the game has. Now, not only is the picture soft to an annoying degree, but it's also covered by a static effect that is most predominant in high contrast shades, meaning most of the game. Honestly, I'm sort of struggling with this one. The widescreen picture and cleaned up CG cutscenes have me really wanting to recommend this release of the game, but there are way too many flaws that give me the suspicion the person in charge of this remaster just didn't know a lot about the pleasing relationship between colors and brightness values. This was definitely an older release, but even back then I don't think people equated HD visuals to a more staticky screen with a darker picture. Which really does suck, because there are situations where this game can look pretty okay. I always enjoy a proper widescreen conversion of a 4x3 game from my past, and while this was definitely the best handled aspect of this release, almost every other visual feature of the game seems to faceplant immediately out the door. For the pride of the Ashford family, I will kill you! So I guess now is the time to make a decision. Which version of Code Veronica is the one to reach for in the modern era? And that is a very, very hard question to answer. Each release has something I like in it, and each one also shows off the quirks of its respective console's video output, which I always enjoy looking at. But if you force me to decide, I would have to go with... the Dreamcast original. For some reason, to me, Code Veronica has always felt like a real product of the console it was developed for, and finally getting to see the game run at a crystal clear, beautiful 480p really made an impression on me. The game's lighting and shadow effects just look like they're at home on the original console it was released for, and if you have a DC VGA cable and either a TV that accepts that connection, or a scaler like the OSSC, I would say that is without a doubt the way to go. Sure, you are going to miss out on the changes made in the Code Veronica X releases, but I don't feel like two extra scenes with Wesker in them are worth much at all in the grand scheme of things. Jesus, I am not looking forward to the comments I'm going to get asking me why I hate Wesker so much. Just to be clear, I don't. I just choose good visuals over that stuff. The only caveat I would give is the Dreamcast's heavy use of dithering, which despite being a look I've always enjoyed, some people may find it hard to deal with. If that is indeed the case for you and you absolutely have to grab a version of CVX, I would say go with the one that fits your means and equipment. In my opinion, the PS2 version is the way to go if you lack the ability to force progressive scan as the PS2 has the sharpest 480i output, but if you can run homebrew on either console, the GameCube is the clear winner in terms of 480p. But do keep in mind you're going to need something like original Nintendo component cables, the Carby, or GCHD to get that kind of video out of the console. As far as the more modern ports go, I would go for the PS4 digital release over the PS3 remaster if I were you. While that PS4 version does still contain a lot of the flaws found in the PS2 release, most of them have been mitigated to a degree that it shouldn't cause huge issues for anyone beyond the ultra picky, like myself. The widescreen picture and improvements made to the 2D assets might have made the PS3 remaster the clear winner here if it weren't covered up by a laundry list of flaws about as long as my arm. So if you are looking to enjoy Code Veronica, in my opinion, keeping it within its home console would be the best bet. You really can't beat the beautiful visuals of this game running on real Dreamcast hardware. It really is the best look the game has ever had, in my opinion. 
on top of the control layout making the most sense to my brain. So I guess after all the literal hours spent playing this game in every single way humanly imaginable, my opinion remains exactly as it was four years ago when the Resident Evil retrospective was still being released. Onwards and upwards, right? But what's more important than my subjective take on what's the best looking and playing version of the game to date is that I was able to show you guys each of them running on real hardware so you can get an idea of which one you would prefer. Which I guess is the main question here. My decision aside, which version would you guys go with? I'd be interested to hear your reasoning in the comments section. And I think that's as good a time as any to get out of here. I hope you guys have had fun revisiting what I think is an absolute hidden gem in the Resident Evil series, and I really do appreciate all of the love and positivity you always send my way. But as usual, I will see all of you again right here on the Resident Evil Retrospective. Hello, hello, my good friends. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end of this absolute dork fest of a video. If you get into more in-depth analysis type of content, I'll have some stuff linked on screen that might tickle your fancy, and if you're able to, a little support over on my Patreon page would most definitely be appreciated. For those of you that don't know, me and my wife will soon be moving to Japan, and the goal is for me to continue YouTube full-time, if at all possible. I've had an absolute blast these last few years pumping out content, and I'd like to think some of you have enjoyed watching it just as much as I did making it. So even if it's just a dollar a month, it would give me the safety net I need to continue making the content I enjoy while not having to worry about catering to the algorithm or YouTube trends. If you're not able to give any kind of financial help, trust me, I do understand, and I thank you for just making it this far into the video. Your views, comments, or likes are just as valuable, I assure you. I really do appreciate the hell out of all of you, and here's hoping I can continue delivering the stuff you want to see, because this whole content creation thing has been a dream come true so far. Well, that's about enough out of me, but thanks so much for watching again, and I will see all of you again later.